Hi, so good morning everyone. Um, I brought my friend uh, Robert with me. It was his birthday yesterday, he was 80. And um, as I'm known as a bit of a joker man, uh, you may find uh, that I might drop a few song titles in, uh, but it's all good, uh, even if there is a bit of an idiot wind blowing through this talk. Um, this is Modelling Solutions to the Impact of COVID-19 on Cardiac Waiting Lists, or, and I can say that uh, this is genuinely coming from the heart uh, for reasons that I shall explain, but the road is long. Uh, moving on, uh, basically what I want to do is I want to give you a complete uh, and uh, authoritative history of the whole of mathematics in healthcare in one slide. Uh, and in particular, I, rather strangely, I want to bring up the role of the Bristol Heart Scandal um, and how that changed uh, um, data collection and drawing inference from data in the uh, National Health Service. Then I'll, I'll bring us up to date in the VCAMS meeting that we held earlier this year on the 2nd to 4th of February. I'll explain who the dramatis personae were um, and one of the three, uh, unlike Chris giving an overview of all of the things that were discovered, uh, this is very much work in progress and I want to tell you one strand of work uh, that I've personally been involved with, although most of what I show you will be other people's work. Uh, and I'll show you the problem and the approach that we've taken and what's happened since and then finally try and um, collect some lessons learned if we can. Um, maybe someday uh, we will understand uh, everything there is to know about heart failure, uh, but the problem is data, data everywhere, and it's a chronic problem. Okay, so uh, here is my history of maths in healthcare. This is very biased. It's very biased towards the UK. Um, the first character I want to talk about is Florence Nightingale. Um, her popular image of the Lady of the Lamp and as a nurse and as a founder of nursing, masks the fact that she was a fantastic social reformer, she was a fellow of the Royal Statistical Society, and she essentially invented the infographic. It wasn't that, you know, the Lady of the Lamp went round and, and um, tended to the sick soldiers, she gathered the data that showed that the vast majority of soldiers in the Crimea were dying of preventable diseases, and she presented that data in a beautiful infographic. And that's what was she known for throughout her life. And probably she made the biggest um, increase in life expectancy uh, in modern medicine in the UK until the discovery of antibiotics for what she did afterwards. Basically, she was a campaigner, single-handed campaigner uh, to lobby for um, improvements in uh, public sanitation. Second person is a more um, perhaps controversial character um, in that uh, uh, allegedly he was a eugenicist, um, Ronald Fisher, um, but he really was the pioneer, one of the many pioneers along with uh, Pearson and others and, uh, and the, the, the uh, Reverend Bayes many years previously in the whole idea of um, having design of experiments and uh, using significance testing. And this led to what is today the gold standard in the use of mathematics in healthcare, namely the double blind control trial. And there are um, fantastic innovations now in how to conduct um, partial double blind control trials, how to um, conduct virtual trials, but essentially it's all about historical data and the p-value, Pearson's p-coefficient from the chi-square distribution um, rules uh, about significance testing. But I want to tell you a story that involves a fellow of the uh, Institute, David Spiegelhalter, uh, Professor of Public Understanding of uh, Risk, uh, the Winton Professor in Cambridge. And I think he's played a role in uh, the use of routinely correct collected data. This isn't double blinded data. This is messy, everyday hospital data. And he's um, been involved in some high profile cases, um, so-called health scandals, uh, at looking at the effect of um, interventions or just not even interventions, just the effect of is this death rate, it's very, you know, this is all traumatic stuff, um, it's a touchy situation which could land me in trouble, um, but it does have a tight connection to my heart as I'll explain. Um, does this, uh, and I ain't going to grieve um, necessarily uh, uh, for uh, stuff that's coming beyond the horizon, uh, sorry I, I will stop uh, quoting Bob Dylan songs I promise, um, that uh, does, did, is this significant? Is this performance of this hospital? Was this rogue doctor, uh, did it make a difference? And, and I think the thing that made the difference and it is um, 
close to me because my oldest son was born in 1995, not in the uh, Bristol Children's Hospital, but one of our um, friends from a baby group uh, had life-saving heart surgery in the Bristol Children's Hospital at that time. Um, there were some harrowing stories of botched heart operations on babies. Or was it a story about a disgruntled anaesthetist leaking stuff to the press? Uh, what's clear is before then, and in the Bristol Hospital, the whole of the NHS was riddled with this consultant knows best culture, not blaming any particular consultants. It was, it was a kind of, uh, there wasn't a learning from mistakes kind of culture like there is perhaps in the aircraft industry or the nuclear industry, etc. And the answer, of course, was statistics. And it was the statistics of messy, routinely collected data that wasn't held in proper databases, that was scribbled on pieces of paper, that wasn't reconciled with other databases. And I, um, if you look at the report, uh, there's a, a nice um, paper in the Royal Statistical Society uh, journals um, that uh, looks at the team uh, that David Spiegelhalter led then at the MRI uh, Center in Cambridge for um, health informatics. And um, they estimated on, by comparing what happened at Bristol to other places, that there were, um, particularly on infant uh, baby op um, heart operations, those under uh, 12 months old, there were some systematic failures that led to possibly 30 to 35 deaths. That's an estimate, it's not the particular patients they're pointing to. But uh, controversially, the inquiry did not look at morbidity and it's been estimated that there was something more like 150 early deaths. But this is, I don't wish to belittle this, this is a very sad um, episode, but this was life-saving surgery. And, but the effect of this scandal was twofold. Firstly, it led to, I think, unprecedented changes in the NHS, uh, that success data in various procedures now drives improvements. Consultants and, and all surgery, uh, they look at success data, they compare them between consultants, they compare them between hospitals. And in particular in cardiac surgery, as an outcome of that inquiry, the National Institute for Cardiovascular Outcomes Research was set up that has a big public database of the outcome of every hospital uh, in cardiac surgery and every procedure. These pictures on the right are the old Bristol Children's Hospital, which as this, uh, and the new one, and as this uh, inquiry was reporting in 2001, our faculty moved. Uh, we were having some new building work into the old Children's Hospital, which again brought a rather chilling reminder. So, with all this unprecedented data, particularly to do with um, cardiovascular research, uh, one of the things that came up in our VCHEMS discussion was the fact that there are news reports about COVID-19 causing increased late waiting lists due to cancelled surgery. And I remember talking with Claire and uh, Matt, both of whom are here, and saying, why don't we look at this on the whole? And then um, Claire in particular had a very good link with Adam Annenbrook's uh, hospital. Uh, but we said, why not study cancer? Now the problem with cancer is cancer is many diseases. Every cancer is different. Whereas actually cardiovascular diseases is quite contained. I mean, it's a, it's a chronic condition rather than acute necessarily. And it's also the biggest killer worldwide and uh, the biggest killer of men in the UK. It's actually dementia, according to the Office of National Statistics, uh, that is the biggest killer of women. Sorry for using words like killer. Um, we all have to die of something, cause of death, I should say. Um, and this NICOR data and other data is comprehensive. And in the University of Leeds, in the University of Keele and my colleague in Bristol, we found some uh, clinicians who were also data experts and who had collected data on what had happened during the pandemic to various cardiac uh, related treatments. And they knew how to collect the data, but they wanted to answer the question, what should you do with the data? And what they want to do, of course, is improve patient outcomes. So what happened? Well, you can read what happened in the in the study group report. I um, hope somebody will cut and paste that into the into the uh, chat. It was just a three day meeting, and of course, in that um, three day meeting, nothing was decided. There wasn't time to think, and we were uh, mixed up in confusion. Uh, and it was all a bit of magic, um, but uh, we were living with the blues during most of that time. And we split into three separate teams that looked at this big problem through three separate lenses. I would say that this isn't exactly the same as in um, the study group that Chris talked about, where there were three separate 
problems. It's really looking at the same problem in three different ways. One was looking at a national picture of uh, cardiac waiting lists. Another was looking at a very uh, definitive procedure, um, which is uh, life improving, um, which is um, aortic stenosis, uh, essentially where a certain stent is put into a major artery. Uh, and there are two different ways of doing it and looking at the effect that the pandemic has had on all the canceled surgeries. And the other was looking at the bigger question of chronic heart disease uh, using data from uh, the Leeds uh, Trust. I'm only gonna talk about challenge three because that's the only one I really know about is the one I was involved with, but actually the, both in terms of the uh, design of the study group and in terms of the outcome, I would say all three challenges are now somehow intertwined. It's the uh, simple twist of fate, of course. Uh, the clinicians who I mentioned were uh, Chris Gale uh, and his registrar Ramesh uh, Nadaraja uh, at Leeds who um, have uh, been collecting data along with Mamas Mamas at the University of Kiel and my colleague Ben Gibson uh, who is a um, cardiac anaesthetist at the University of Bristol and Bristol of course um, partly as a result of what happened in the 1990s has some of the most complete and uh, long-lasting data on um, cardiac outcomes. And these are some of the uh, people involved. I will single out a few, or there are many more names here. Uh, I'm probably singling out the wrong people for which I apologize. Uh, the name Jess Enright crops up again. She's been absolutely fantastic uh, during VCAMS, as has Rebecca Hoyle, Lars Schurler from the University of Edinburgh, and Christine Curry from the University of Southampton, whose name will crop up again, because I'm gonna talk about challenge three. And uh, this would not have been possible without the effort of Matt Butchers, essentially uh, very much of VCHEMS was due to his instigation and Claire Merritt who ran this workshop, who made it work, who formed the connections, etc. from the Newton Gateway, who is Jane's uh, colleague there. Uh, and it was Claire who uh, was the manager of this particular uh, VCHEMS workshop. So I want to talk about chronic heart failure. What is chronic heart failure? Well, it's a loosely defined ongoing poor heart function leading eventually to death by uh, the heart ceasing to pump blood. It is not the same as heart attack. I hadn't realized this until I was at this. Uh, myocardial infarction is heart attack, which is a clot in your blood vessels supplying your heart, uh, which leads to heart tissue death and can be fatal or not. Uh, there are many causes of chronic heart failure, uh, high blood pressure, age, um, and indeed there's complication. There are um, often uh, when in, in the higher, um, uh, disease states, uh, there are um, in a more uh, advanced degree disease states, there are comorbidities with all kinds of things and heart attack can occur. It can also be a cause of chronic heart disease. And the primary diagnosis is via symptoms, breathlessness, chest pain, leg swelling. Um, and then in the doctor's surgery, uh, you can have a ECG where they attach the electrodes to you and have a blood test. Um, and then there's a secondary diagnosis with an echocardiogram, which is uh, rather unfortunate, also has the uh, three-letter abbreviation ECG, which is an ultrasound image of the heart. And this would typically be through the hospital or through some uh, specialist cardiac um, treatment centre. Uh, and the diagnosis there is if the left ventricular uh, ejection volume is less than 40%, uh, then that means it's something wrong with the heart rather than something wrong with the, the rest of the circulatory. And it's only really these cases that are treatable. And there are roughly defined clinical stages. Uh, and in stage four, 80% of people, as I was saying earlier, have other underlying conditions. But early diagnosis is the key to longer life expectancy because um, those the treatment, the most successful treatment is change in lifestyle and some really quite... Um, specialized drugs uh, for those that uh, have the low volume uh, of the left ventricular uh, ejection. And the median life expectancy post-diagnosis is five years and it's estimated there may be up to a million uh, people in the UK currently uh, with heart failure. And it's a complex disease, it's really a number of different diseases and here's from a big government report on um, heart failure there's, uh, this actually has five separate stages um, and uh, you can uh, be responding to treatment and essentially in remission, you can have some forms of instability and then um, can be um, essentially uh, in a very poor state and have end of life care. And there's broadly three treatments, as I was saying, primary at the GP, 
uh, secondary uh, with the cardiac specialists in the hospital. Uh, have, there are also mild interventions. And <coughs> what you hear about is heart transplants, pacemakers, etc. That is a tiny percentage of people who have heart failure. That is the, the tip of the iceberg, the very expensive and highly specialized tip. It's mostly this secondary treatment uh, that is, uh, brings the most success on average. So when we looked at the data, um, Leeds had been and um, Keel had been collecting this data, some interesting things happened. The main hypothesis, there was detailed data between um, uh, April and November uh, 2020. So during the pandemic and after the pandemic, and there was a wave of canceled uh, procedures, a wave of people who hadn't visited the hospital uh, during that um, first lockdown. And then there was a bounce back. And the uh, hypothesis is there will be another wave that will happen after this, what is it, third lockdown. Um, and the data from primary care showed that the number of ECGs uh, was down 66%. Uh, the number of hospital referrals from the GPs was down 80%. Uh, in secondary care, um, the waiting list had increased one and a half fold uh, for an echocardiogram. But the number of referrals, acute referrals, this is people coming in um, with uh, chronic heart failure because they've um, uh, suffered symptoms was down 50%. This could be they come in in an ambulance or they come in from the doctors. But the waiting list to see cardiologists, the waiting list to actually have appointments, hadn't changed. Hadn't changed at all. And in end of life care, there is some evidence to suggest some more people have died uh, with chronic heart failure, but perhaps they hadn't died from it. It it's often has comorbidities. Uh, deaths in the community were up and in the hospital were down. Uh, without medication, I should say, life expectancy decreases by about 50%. Um, so what was our idea to build a mathematical model of this? And I can spell mathematical and it's not like that. Uh, use data from steady state to parameterize some kind of patient flow model. And that patient flow model needs to both capture uh, whether, um, what kind of treatment patients are undergoing in this system and also what their disease state is. And then use the perturbation from the pandemic to model different volumes of patients in the system at different disease states. And then run the model to see what happened in the first wave using data from uh, leads, and then put some kind of optimization wrapper around the model so we can run some what if scenarios and see which ones actually give you improved outcome in the long term. And we've started with a discrete event simulation approach and we're hoping to move into uh, incorporating this into some bigger system dynamics model, uh, which I might tell you about very briefly at the end. Uh, and that would be with NHS Improved because during the study group we discovered a group based in Birmingham who were building generally a waiting list decision support tool using system dynamics and the long the medium term aim is to work with them. Okay so here's the conceptual model it has two parts essentially um, there are people who are uh, not in the treatment system so that could be that they've they've been treated and they're back in the community, or they're currently in a GP waiting list, or they're currently in the hospital, maybe receiving drugs, uh, maybe receiving uh, complex surgery. And then there's the disease state, which is, um, we model it with three, it can be four dis disease states, um, where you can transition over time with some probability. And obviously whether you're treated or not will change those probabilities. Um, and, here are some very, very preliminary results. Uh, the next slide says whose work the, uh, this is. So the beauty of working with Leeds, particularly with Ramesh, has been um, the fact that they have lots of data of actual patient numbers uh, that goes alongside the national statistics on percentage of people in the community with various conditions, etc. cetera. And um, we modeled uh, the effect essentially fitted data up to um, the, when the data runs out on the 2nd of November, and then started to look at preliminary data and then run a forward model based on all kinds of uh, either deterministic or statistical distributions of how many patients are at each stage. 
So at the moment, we're not modeling this simple model, only models flow of patients through the system. It is not modeling progression, not modeling yet, progression of disease states. And here are some results. So this is all the work of two fantastic PhD students uh, together with their supervisors. So Alan Wise has been seconded from the University of Lancaster um, with some money from uh, ICMS and the uh, Newton Gateway uh, to um, work uh, with the clinicians in Leeds, um, not physically because of uh, lockdown, of course, uh, and inputting their data into this uh, discrete event simulation model. And the, the model has been coded, or part of it has been coded by Alex Heeb, uh, who is Christine Curry's PhD student at the University of Southampton, and he was uh, present at the workshop. And this is just the very first stage of when you see the cardiologist. And it looks at what happened for this secondary test, this secondary diagnosis, this uh, echocardiogram. And uh, the blue bars on the left here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, the blue bars on the left show what happened in the first lockdown. There was a downturn in a uh, number of uh, GPs um, uh, referrals, but there was a massive downturn in the number of people who actually turned up at the GPs. So the waiting lists uh, coming from uh, the GPs going straight to booking an echocardiogram went down and there was a tiny little blip uh, in those coming from the hospital. And that's essentially why the waiting lists didn't really change. The cardiologist waiting list is far, far fewer patients presented with symptoms. This is a chronic condition that the kind of the implicit message that people got was stay away from hospitals, stay away from doctors. So then what we've seen is, a, is an upswing of uh, patients uh, developing symptoms and suddenly the queue built up and then uh, went down again. But this model predicts that after the second lockdown, this queue will not go down very quickly. This model goes all the way to uh, the end of um, 2022 and the prediction is, uh, sorry, to January 2022. And the prediction is actually there will be a long-term um, uh, waiting list just for this one stage, the echocardiogram. And these are with 90% confidence intervals based on the LEADS data. So what do we want to do? Um, the next step that we're working on at the moment is including disease progression. Now, the trouble with that is, um, Whereas you know when somebody has an appointment in a hospital where they are, you don't necessarily know what their current disease state is, and also it's not a very well-defined thing. But um, Ramesh has discovered a blood test, which um, serves as a beautiful proxy for the disease state, and this is usually taken on entering the hospital. So that gives us a, a you know, when you first see the cardiologist, this gives us a datum with which we can classify uh, the patients in our model. And then we can model flow through the treatment pathways. And um, again, there's data on what the various treatments do to uh, different patients. So this should be possible to build into the model and estimate their disease progression. And essentially, what we want to do is model the change in life expectancy of each patient. But, you know, it's not a question of serving the waiting list. It's actually managing the chronic disease that is heart failure and increasing overall life expectancy. You know, we want to minimize suffering. That's essentially what medicine's about. Um, and run what-if scenarios of prioritizing different patients or treatments. Should you prioritize patients who've been through the echocardiogram and now are on the drugs but they're not necessarily working, or should you um, characterize, uh, prioritize the early diagnosis? Should we um, free up lots of hospital beds for the more interven interventional uh, treatments? But there's a problem. There's a problem. How do we optimize? There's a beautiful uh, measure, which is the quality adjusted life years, which is um, essentially it's overall life expectancy of all the people that you're talking about adjusted for the quality of life. So that if somebody is bedridden, that's not as good as if somebody is active, etc. So if you do that, this problem is easy to solve. It's easy. All you do is don't treat the very sick. Let them die quickly. And then those who are getting sicker, but on the waiting list, you'll treat them and quickly clear that bit. And you will improve on average the overall quality adjusted life years of your cohort. That is unethical. You can't do that. You can't not treat the very sick. The alternative is to treat the sickest first, whilst those who have not yet been treated 
who are getting sicker and sicker um, are going to be in a worse position. And overall, you will not uh, maximize the quality adjusted life years of your cohort. I would argue that that's also unethical, just to treat the sickest first. Um, and so what we want to do is try and design a, if you look at the number of patients on a waiting list and some kind of urgency level, we want to look at how can we minimize some, some weighting, it may not be linear, we want to think about uh, working with clinicians, um, how to minimize uh, some weighted sum of patients at different levels. This is a tricky and ethically complex uh, question. Uh, longer term goals are to, um, we are just about to put an ad out. I just uh, heard this morning that uh, it's been finally approved by the University of Bristol uh, with some money from my colleagues in the Bristol Heart Institute for a short term postdoc to implement this within the NHS Improve uh, Systems Dynamics software to incorporate into a bigger model of patient flow um, and create some simple decision support tool, hopefully, that can be made available to NHS Trust so that the input to this is various data that they have and then that can enable them to make some sensible decisions about where to prioritize resources and uh, when the wave is coming as well. And ultimately, the goal is the clinicians keep telling us it's lovely to, do, to build some mathematical models, but what we really like to do is improve patient lives. So what are the lessons learned, learned from this? I think chronic heart disease is a good case study for maths and healthcare. It's, it's a chronic disease. And in fact, I've heard, seen the estimate that 80% of the health budget is now spent on managing chronic disease, even HIV, many cancers, uh, multiple sclerosis and others, and our chronic dis diseases that we have to um, establish the best way of allowing patients to live with these diseases, rather than the model we generally have of medicine is you go to the hospital or the doctor and they make you better. Uh, it's a complex group of degenerative conditions and it's thought to currently uh, affect about 2% uh, of the UK. Um, and this primary, secondary, tertiary care pathways are complex. It isn't just a question of um, let's manage the waiting list, let's clear a backlog of a waiting list. It's more subtle than that. Um, COVID-19 has not affected the waiting list in a simple way. When we looked at chronic heart disease, the amazing thing was there is no increase in the waiting list. But there is a wave coming and uh, the preliminary modeling already shows that that wave is gonna be there for a long time afterwards. And the biggest buildup actually is those not yet entering the primary stage, those in the community who are getting worse. And that's leading to a bottleneck of diagnosis and um, those patients that are coming through, both through um, later presentation and the bottleneck in diagnosis have more severe disease states than before. And that ultimately is uh, the problem in a nutshell. So we're trying to build, and I say we, it's, um, you know, uh, many other people, I'm only fringe involved, I would say, build a patient flow model and parameterize it using this um, detailed data from Leeds uh, and thinking of the pandemic as a perturbation. And just possibly, if you think of a complex system, you know, my background is dynamical systems. One of the ways in which we analyze complex systems is perturb them and see what happens. Or for an engineer, it's like the impulse response. And of course, nobody would like a global pandemic to be an impulse response, uh, to cause an impulse response to study the system. Nobody would have asked for that, but um, somehow this has given us an opportunity, arguably, to look at how actually that healthcare system is being uh, driven and how it's built. Um, and we can think of a more general process uh, based approach to treatment optimization rather than just curing uh, backlogs. Um, there is talk of a data revolution in healthcare. Um, there is now this, we, we've moved away from this idea that the only data that is important, other than financial data, let, let's not go there, uh, is this data from very carefully controlled, very statistically controlled, double-blinded um, trials, which are crucially important, as we've seen with the vaccine approvals, etc. They're crucially important. Actually, using root data to optimize uh, treatment of patients and uh, also flow. There's an and missing in that sentence, I apologize. And that, I would say, is all about collaboration. It isn't just about AI, Google DeepMind or whatever. In my view, it's about a collaboration between all kinds of traditional disciplines within mathematics, statistics, operations research, data science, 
and not forgetting the domain experts. They really know what the question is. If, you know, if, if somebody asks me what is the most important part of mathematical modeling, it's talk to the expert. I simply cannot stress enough the, the um, in my view, uh, the importance of listening when building a mathematical model and the importance of humid humility, not humidity. Thank you very much. So there were some odds and ends. Um, you might say I didn't have to do that. And of course, there are many people who are gone and not forgotten uh, when talking about this, including sadly, my brother. My brother died of chronic heart disease earlier this year, my only sibling. He was not ill. Nobody knew there was anything wrong with him. He just didn't wake up one day. So this is genuinely close to my heart. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. That brilliant, brilliant presentation from you as always, um, and, and very touching note to, to finish on. Um, I can't see that there are any um, Q and A's at the moment. There must be some questions, surely, from um, from people. Um, now's the time to type. If you if you're able to submit any questions, anyone. So, Alan, you've just you've you've just you're recruiting this um, person. Uh, yeah. So um, we're uh, it's you know, as always getting small amounts of money in the short term is not necessarily easy. But um, the Bristol uh, Heart Foundation or the Bristol Heart Institute have managed to secure some money for a postdoc. And I've been trying to uh, just for six months. Uh, but hopefully, you know, I think this is a I'm not trying to uh, overestimate. Uh, how the little things that we're doing are going to make a difference. We're, we're not the answer. There are many other people. Some of the work that, um, for example, Paul Harper, um, mathematician at the University of Cardiff, has been doing around operations research in uh, medicine is absolutely fantastic. Uh, but um, we uh, have money to get this person to, or get somebody to work with the uh, NHS Improve in Birmingham and um, we just got, I just got the cost code this morning. Uh, so that, uh, hopefully it will go out in the next week or so. Well it's not done. out yet. Whilst you've been explaining a bit more about that, um, a very valuable follow on, uh, we've got a few questions. So Jeremy asks, he says, thanks, Alan. How do you choose alpha dash I in your objective function if you might want to look at this, Alan, because there's some funny little calculations here are unethical. How do you decide? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question. Yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good question. I, I guess you, again, talk to the experts. Um, and we're not there yet, but actually this is where medical ethics comes in. And medical ethics is important. Um, and so we're not yet at that stage, but I would talk to experts in medical ethics. Um, and it's a wicked problem. Uh, ultimately, I guess, you come up with a series of Pareto fronts, depending on your choice of different alphas to be technical about it. And then you work with experts to say which of these is ethically um, uh, ethically defensible. Okay, thanks, Alan. Uh, Chandra asks, are there approaches not data-driven for modeling which are useful for the NHS? It, it, it's a good question. Um, the answer is, of course, yes. I mean, the, um, you know, there's a lot now of uh, mathematical biology, of mathematical physiology, and I'm also involved in, a, in, in some of that that um, involves um, a mixture of hybrid models, continuum models, etc. Um, and one of the issues with sort of multi-scale modeling um, is uh, it's very easy to build a model that is, un as Chris was saying, really complex. Uh, it can produce some amazing graphics, lots of statistical graphs, but it doesn't actually help you. Sometimes the answer is to produce a model that is simple, but gives you a principle. And so the, the issue with modeling is always, what is the question? As well as asking the expert, the other thing I would say about modeling, any model is, what is the question? And the, you know, the SIR model, it's been in the news a lot, has been unbelievably successful in answering different questions. And it's not like there is a model for COVID-19 there are many ways of using mathematical modeling to help you answer questions. Yeah. So that can involve um, equation-based modeling, laws of physics-based modeling, uh, continuum models, et cetera. Um, but I think in the modern era, one always has to, you know, as a, I'm not a data-driven modeler, that's not my background, but I take my hat off to those who are, um, because I think everything has to be informed by the truth somehow. 
Yeah, there's the last one on here, uh, VJ. He says, he, I, I enjoyed your talk. Um, he said, you didn't show so much the statistics used. What would be the basic topics to present? I would like to show this to some of my undergrads to inspire them. Now that's oh, something yeah. very much after my own heart. I wonder if it might be worth you and VJ being in touch about this, Alan. Yeah, um, what I can say, VJ, is um, actually what I've just given you is a sneak preview of my next Westwood Ho column uh, or feature, uh, which will come out in next month's um, Mathematics Today. That has some references in it. Um, and as this talk, and essentially this project, and when I write those features, which I enjoy immensely, um, I learn, I, I'm learning as I do it, and I try and give references to the things that I found the most useful. And actually I found some of David Spiegelhalter's work to be the most useful. Uh, yeah, VJ, tweet me, yeah, sure. That's great. There, it's always good to inspire students, isn't it? And early career researchers. <laughs> well, they inspire us as well. I mean, that's the other thing. I'm, I'm amazed, you know, um, I, as I was going through this talk and I realized I'd highlighted a few names, um, my experience of these study groups is that, you know, the, the, the innovation comes from the early career people and us professors are being tugged along behind, yeah. um, perhaps yeah. providing a bit of moral support or whatever, but it's nearly always um, enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is so important in building mathematical models and, and, and not, not being afraid of being stupid or making mistakes. You're absolutely right, Alan, but I think you're being very modest because it's people like you and Chris Budd. Um, and some of the other academics I work with whose mentoring is absolutely essential in, in inspiring these early career researchers and also for, for doing this great work. So I think, um, I think we're all done. We are, we're, we've run slightly over, but thank you so much to uh, all our speakers, to Matt Butchers, Chris Budd and Alan Champlis for some fabulous talks. I don't think there's anything else to say now. I think um, the RIMA colleagues will probably close down the webinar, but thank you everybody. Brilliant, really interesting, thank you.